A famous European band once wrote a song and said, money, money, money. And of course, when... <laughs> keep dancing. <laughs> Welcome to Chaps Many Cultures, episode 112. And as we do in our work, we, talk, we work with a lot of people that are moving around the world. And of course, when you move, your money moves with you or perhaps not. Perhaps it all can't move with you. And there are certain considerations we have to take into account. And we've got someone today that's going to tell us what we might have to think about when we do that. Stick around. Yes, welcome back, folks. A show about the business of culture and the culture of business. I don't ever remember which way I did that, The uh, which, which way there's the right way around to say that, but it's both applicable. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> money, money, money. You can say that from the front and the back. And my Swedish friends will be very happy you made that reference. There we go. For oh, those of you who don't know, we won't tell you, but you can put your guess in who sang that money, money, money. Put it in the, <laughs> in the comment box. Uh, first one who gets it right gets, um, I'll think about that, what you get. Um, well, a two, a, a, a two chaps, two chaps t-shirt. How about that? When we eventually make them one day. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Make sure <laughs> you eventually. put your size in as well. So we send you the right size. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what about this money thing? You have any? Um, you know, I try and I try and keep a little bit in the side, but you know, I travel and all that kind of stuff. Um, all the important things in in life, you know. Um, we we you know we hope to keep a little bit of it, and uh, everybody tries to keep a little bit of it. And we also may have uh, you know stuff that we own, stuff that we want to keep, stuff that we want to take with us when we go on our little adventure around the world. Um, it's important that we uh, think of considerations um, when it comes to money as we say. And, you know, of course, I'm no expert when it comes to money. I don't know about you, young sir. I don't know. Expert would be an exaggeration. Of, I hope the colors remain black. I think that's the main thing that they told me in school, right? Make sure that the ink right. is black. And so that, whatever that means, I hope that's the, I hope I did that right. But I also heard that when you move around the world for work, money may not always follow you automatically. And you're you won't have access to your funds the same way you had before. Maybe your employer will tell you that your funds will be distributed differently than they were before. And I always thought that was like, ah, who figures that stuff out? There's got to be some mastermind behind the scenes who has got the magic abacus and, and ha has that all figured out. So I think you know somebody, right? Yes. Let's bring right. him on. All right, right, okay. Here he is. All right. Here. The thing about Brett we'll get right from the start. You know, he's an Aussie. His name is Brett, and he's from Queensland. And as that famous poet of our time, Meatloaf, said, two, eight, two out of three ain't bad. How are you, mate? <laughs> hey, I'm well. I'm well. I think uh, I, uh, it's a pretty hard act to follow listening to you guys on. But um, now, look, long story short, can't complain because no one in my house ever listens anyway. That's right. Very good. Well, I'm welcome, sir. Between two and Aussie breads, I'm not sure how, how this is going to go, but all right. <laughs> so, so when I say Brett, I mean the guy with the headphones. I'm not talking to you, Chicago Aussie. Um, oh, oh. So <laughs> headphones, Brett, you are – sorry. Um, you're, you're based where in the world? Not in Australia, right? Uh, we're based in the, in the sandpit. We, uh, we work out of uh, Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. and we also have an office in Australia. So – working with clients in over 30 countries. Um, the Western Hemisphere was a bit of a dark spot for us in terms of being able to service clients effectively. So we virtually cut the world in half just uh, east of Mumbai. So now the Australian office looks after Asia and the United States. And I have the pleasure of working with clients from Mumbai through to London. So uh, working with the states from Australia is quite easy because most people want to talk to you after hours. But uh, working with clients in the UK, yeah, you know, they want to call it midday, um, which is ungodly hour in, in Australia. So now we've virtually tried to demarcate ourselves. Um, you know, expats 
uh, it, it never ceases to amaze you where you find an expert. Every stone, you, you know, you unturn, if you hear a noise, someone having a party, someone, you know, doing on, it's always an expert yeah. Yeah. of any nation. <laughs> someone doing an unruly thing, it's probably an expat. So <laughs> yeah. um, ha, ha, for those of you who don't know you, because the two Bretts, apparently, if you haven't caught on to this, folks, these guys know each other, right? It's 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 uncanny. Name, location. <laughs> yeah. Except same kind of humor, each other. wicked, wicked. So um, Brett in, in the Emirates and Brett in Dubai, that's what I'm going to call you. Brett in Dubai. Um, okay. What makes you an expert on expat money? I think it's to me twofold. So became a an expat at six months of age. Had the pleasure of moving to Tucson, Arizona. Um, Get out of folks in Tucson or Tucson. Um, long story short, lived there for five years. Father was in the Air Force. Came back to Australia, and uh, then moved to Hong Kong. Dad moved there with uh, with the airlines. So I've always been in the expat ecosystem, and like I've always said expats have a different vernacular, uh, different traits and all those sort of things. So one thing when you're dealing in a service business like ourselves is being able to understand your client base. The other thing is I've always worked in finance and over the years, um, global regulation has really picked up, you know, for, for managing your finances, the world is a very small place now. So repetitively, I was getting questions from colleagues and clients who are still overseas. I was back in Australia at the time, and they said, we're gonna help with this, help with this, help with this. So uh, 2011, I uh, decided to leave uh, a little firm called Citigroup and set up uh, Atlas Wealth Management and um, been doing it full-time ever since. Mm. Great. That's fascinating. So, so that's your that's your puppy then, or are you part of the yeah. founders? No. no. No, no, I'm a founder and a majority owner. So um, nice. I had the pleasure of, yeah, look, walking the walk and talking the talk. It's the buck stops with me. Uh, and my colleague, James, who runs the, um, the Australian office, he's the other part owner. And, uh, you know, to me, it's the sort of job where I guess it's not really a part-time role when it comes to keeping on top of regulatory changes and all those sort of things because, you know, obviously we specialise in Australian expats, but for any nationality, it's the same. The regulatory and tax landscape is changing constantly. And when you're providing financial advice, essentially it's two-dimensional advice. So think of someone like Brett going to talk to a financial advisor in Chicago. You're just talking about state laws and federal laws in, in the United States and how they pertain to US assets. When we talk to clients, we talked about assets that are held in Chicago, and possibly Australia, and how those two work together with the IRS and the ATO, which nine times out of ten they don't. Mm. So it it is it is like tapping your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time because one will change, the other one will change. It's just this constant vortex of, um, uh, you know, as a lawyer client always said, you know, we don't like the status quo and we don't live in a status quo world. Hmm. Money, you know, finances are. Finances are a, um, a, I mean, there are some people that probably say, oh, you know, money, it's just like, it's one of those things you hope that um, that sticks to you as you go through life and, uh, and, and and that would be easy in your home. Where just, I mean, I know you work with, you know, ostensibly concentrate on the Australian expat community, but in terms of just general, what do you see as common mistakes of people when they make before they leave, before they kind of push their boat off the shore? What are some of the things, the common things that maybe people that that's ubiquitous around the world? Look, I think it's three things. The first thing is when they're researching that move overseas, finances is priority number 50 or 60. The first one is where they're going to live, where the cool's get, kids are going to go to school, cool pubs in the area, restaurants, where they can travel to, you know, a lot of the sexy stuff of moving overseas. And what they don't realise is when they jump on that plane, um, for any nationality, quite often your tax status changes and so does that of your assets. Most people, when they do look at taking a move overseas, they've got something. They might have a house, they might have some super or foreign pension saved up, might have some, you know, ETFs or, you know, let me, let me, cash. Let me just, let, let me just uh, translate there, super <laughs> for, yeah, for those. 401k. Superannuation <laughs> like 401ks, uh, retirement funds and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, short, yeah. short, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the biggest problem I think we find with it all is you know, the vast majority of uh, residency tax laws for any country uh, are incredibly outdated. So if you look at the Australian tax laws written in 1936, 
you go through and look at the residency test to qualify as a resident or non-resident for tax purposes, they use old fashioned words like domicile and reside. Um, United States is a classic example. You know, the, the tax rules of the United States date back to the 1800s of a citizenship based tax rule that you know, follows you around the world. So even if you're in the place like Dubai, where I am, um, you still pay US tax like you would if you're in Chicago. Uh, and that actually dates back to the Civil War days to stop people absconding. So, you know, we're trying to dovetail in this modern world where we have, you know, digital nomads and freelancers and everyone's traveling around the world, but the tax laws haven't caught up with that. And um, unfortunately, you, you do get a lot of you know, unintended consequences as a result mm. of that. I've heard, and I'm not sure if this is just uh, expat myths uh, that are being thrown around, but I heard of uh, US expats abroad um, who were on longer assignments and they were fed up with paying, uh, paying that uh, the same taxes that they were paying when they were still living in the US, uh, that some of them uh, rescinded their US citizenship in, in order to avoid being double taxed. Is it FICA? Well, what is it called? There's some FATCA. kind of... Yeah. F-A-T-C-A. Uh, have, have, is that just a rumor, or have you have you heard of incidences where where U.S. citizens said, "Hey, I'm I'm done with double paying. I'm being taxed here in my country of residence, and my passport country still wants money for me, even though I don't uh, I don't live there." Have you heard cases like that? It is huge. It is huge. Oh. Yeah, there's Facebook groups. There's there's uh, the latest article I saw was uh, what they call um, accidental Americans. Is probably the best way to describe it. You know, mm -hmm. and my brother is one of those. He was born in Tucson, Arizona. So mm -hmm. even though he lived there until he's about four years of age and then moved back to Australia, um, mm -hmm. he's an accidental American. Now, there was a case, I think it came out of Netherlands this week, suing uh, the US government in terms of, you know, them not having to comply with FATCA. Uh, Boris Johnson, classic example. Boris was actually born in the United States. So when Boris sold his house recently, the IRS gave him a bill. <laughs> And he, and he said, yeah, this is ridiculous, wow. but guess what? He actually ended up paying it because it's it's the law. Um, you know, people rescinding their US and citizenship, it, the, the numbers are off the, off the charts at the moment. You know, there's, I can't remember the exact numbers and I'll, I'll come back to this later on um, uh, and put some links into, into the comments with respect to the actual numbers. The numbers are record numbers of the amount of Americans or amount of US citizens or accidental Americans who are rescinding their, their US citizenship because the biggest problem you find is people don't, I'm not saying that at mind paying tax, but whatever's fair and equitable. And um, what we're seeing is people who may have lived in America from you know one to three years of age who are getting caught up in something that they've never set foot back in there as a resident anyway. and. Um, you know, US and Eritrea are the only two countries in the world that apply a citizenship-based tax. Everyone else is residency-based. So um, there is a big call there, but, you know, at the moment, you know, the IRS are getting, you know, a nice little extra bump in revenue. So why are they going to change it? Mm. I mean, to tax is, is one thing, but I think also if, if you're going abroad and you have, like you said, you have built up whatever level of wealth in your in your last country i'm not saying it's your your passport country but wherever you were before you may have built up some level of well equity right and yeah. um sometimes expatriates will ask themselves well as we are moving on is it best to sell or do we hold on to this what is the the, the what are the prospects of this uh, um, appreciating while we are sent halfway around the globe. Um, is, is that some some of the, the advisory work that your firm does as well? And what, what are special considerations that expatriates want to think about when, when, when going abroad? Got, I think expats, um, they collect bank accounts like everyone else collects baseball cards. So they go from one country to the next. They never get around right. to closing things down. And it's amazing. We had one client who had seven bank accounts in seven countries. And, you know, I said, why? And he's like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And we worked out he's paying about $6,000 US dollars a year in account fees uh, that he wasn't you know, aware of until we consulted the whole lot. You know, to me, when you become a, you know, a, an expat, there are a lot of complications um, in managing your finances because one thing we know for certain is change is a constant with expats. 
you know, they're always going on to their next job. And, you know, we like to refer to our clients as satellites. They just tend to orbit the world. They just don't really settle down anywhere. They've gone here from here, two years to five years. to, And, you know, what we always talk about is you want to accumulate wealth in the country you tend to return to or retire to. Because then when it comes time to move back to wherever home is, the assets are there waiting for you. And, you know, we talk about the, the three key risks when it comes to managing money. Currency risk is number one. Sovereignty risk is number two, and liquidity risk is number three. So mm-hmm. currency risk, and there's a classic example of two clients of ours. Uh, they're in the UK, just about to move back to Australia in 2015, and this little vote happened called Brexit. And at that time, they're holding all of their wealth in sterling, and sterling fell 15%, and they had to defer moving back to Australia for two years because the financial haircut uh, was too large to take. And you know, Murphy's Law always pops his head up at the worst possible time. You know, the second one is is sovereignty risk. You know, in a place like the Middle East here, you know, from a geopolitical point of view, it can get pretty uh, uh, rock and roll at times. Something happens. You just want to make your way to the airport. You don't want to be on your app trying to transfer assets and trying to move things around. You know, you want to just get on that plane and get to the safest destination possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the last one is liquidity risk. You know, liquidity risk is is, you know, we always talk about it, but COVID has been the, the biggest example of why liquidity is an important asset. People are losing their jobs. People are having to move countries. People are paying exorbitant fees for, for airfares. They need to put their hands on, on you know, their assets and be able to get access to those funds during the most difficult times, not when things are all you know, uh, going well. And you know, by having those assets in a domicile that you understand that you can get access to those funds, it makes a lot of these problems go away. You know, everything else sort of filters down from there. But those are the, probably the three key things that we see people struggle with the most, but they can be quite easily navigated. Right. You find um, it, com- when it comes back to the people that are work, obviously a lot of these people, people we're working with, are working with companies that are that they're being sent on behalf of. Do you find and do you find that you, their companies are doing enough to? Uh, engage people like you and and at the, and or at least be open to having conversations they're not no i think to me it's it's more of a tick box exercise you know if uh, a company assigns one of their employees overseas you know they may have kpmg ey give them a briefing which will virtually say you know g'day brett g'day christian uh we understand you're moving to denmark um here is the local tax rules here is how you know this place works best of luck, um, signed off by an associate and two pages of disclaimers. You know, there's really no, um, we, we talk about understanding the financial ramifications of that relocation. That's the biggest thing we see. How does it affect the tax status of your house? How does it affect the tax status of your pension? How does that affect the tax status of your investment account? Um, if you have student debt, is there are there any complications? There's a myriad of things that do, that do come out. And you know, we often find that people come to us with these, you know, accounting reports and they go, I'm more confused than I was to start with. Um, so that's one of the, where we we come in, we do a whole, what we call a statement of advice. Okay, are you aware of if you sold this property while you're overseas, you will pay tax, capital gains tax, you know, in p- perpetuity. Um, there's all these sort of things and everyone's different. You know, there is no cookie cutter scenario for every expat going overseas. So we would love companies to do more you know the biggest thing we often see is and i can't remember the exact numbers you guys might know them better than i do but a reason for an expatriation failing due to finances is huge it's something like 40 mm-hmm. percent mm-hmm. and and i think the one the only one that tops that is you know relationship um, and everything else is quite small after that so to me you don't know what you don't know when you're moving overseas and if you can expect and anticipate things psychologically you're better prepared to deal with that as opposed to here we are we've gone through you know and you i've watched you guys for for a long time now and you do talk about some great topics about psychology of of you know moving to different countries and how that works i mean it, it is a culture shock it is a massive culture shock yeah you don't want the hassle of your australian assets being mm. chucked on top of that you want to turn mm. up in a new country and watch your kids settle in and set up your bank accounts and find where the local supermarkets are and then not being hit with a tax bill because you did something that you thought was the right thing, but you're not realising the ramifications of that move. So um, we would love companies to do a lot more. You know, there's a lot more to it, especially in the US. 
Now, when you become part of a checking boxes exercise, are, are you engaged with um, relocation management groups that farm out some of these expatriate services? So would, would you be part of a, of a big box offering that some of these service providers put together? Or do you come into the story because somebody, an expatriate, fell on their financial face and said, I, I don't want to have this any longer. I need some professional help with this. Unfortunately, I would say 80% of people find us about a year into that move. Hmm. Um, and we haven't invented a time machine yet. So quite often we can't go back and fix things in the past. There's always better outcomes that can be achieved by doing things before you move. Um, there are certainly things we can do post that move as well too. But for us, um, it's that great thing called Google. You know, people will... They'll, they'll talk to a relocation firm or they'll talk to an accounting firm and just walk away more confused and they'll just jump on Google and, and ask that question. And that's how, mm. you know, probably 95% of our clients find us. You know, we don't have offices in uh, Moldova and Mongolia and, and Kazakhstan and stuff like that. Um, people get there and they go, I just don't think this applies to me. Mm. Whereas that's been our saving grace. Atlas could not exist 20 years ago because the platforms weren't there. Um, that conduit wasn't there to, to find that. But I've always said we would love to get at the start. You know, when you get at the start, you can get some amazing outcomes and really smooth out the waves when it comes to making sure that move is a positive thing, both professionally, financially and emotionally. Yeah, It's interesting how that's a common theme. I mean, we do... We might work with people that are leaving for their assignment to go overseas. We also work with people that are coming home. And in that situation, we're always saying, you know, it, it would be great to get six months ahead of this, you know, get 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 into the planning phase of this rather than uh, do it retrospectively. Um, we've got a, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, we've got Brent, a good friend, um, Brent up in Canada who has answered the question properly. You get the T-shirt. Thank you very much, Brent. Well, well, once it's me, don't overpromise, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also the question, the question from Brent, thank you very much, is what impact does COVID-19 travel restrictions, the actual travel restrictions, which is an interesting point, right, because you may be up, people might have been up against a deadline financially in terms of their move and that kind of thing, and so that strategically the move back home or the move overseas was already set. Now we're in the situation where some people just can't move. So uh, have, 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 are you coming across that? We're coming across it on both sides. So there are those where companies move their employees back, in our case, to Australia. So we had you know, a number of clients who work for the big, um, uh, the Exxons, the Chevrons of the world, uh, who have operations throughout Africa. And obviously the companies weren't confident that the local countries and, and jurisdictions were handling it well. So they actually got the whole family out and sent them back to Australia. Um, the ATO from the Australian perspective were, were quite good in that. You know, they sort of understood that they're not back there for work reasons. They're back there from a, from a safety point of view. So it didn't automatically trigger them to be a resident for tax purposes. However, after about six months, the ATO said, okay, borders now reopen. We can start to travel again. You know, if you stay much longer, you will be considered an Australian tax resident, which would have tax consequences on that. Um, also, to a lot of countries, including the Middle East, the your residency is tied to your work visa. So if you were to lose your um, were to lose your job, you know you might have one two months to be able to get out of the country, and if you've got cars and houses and dogs and all those sort of things, uh, it makes it very difficult. But from a financial planning perspective, the biggest one we found was when we're talking about repatriation, we use six to twelve months in terms of timing of when assets get transferred back to not create complications and so on and so forth. Um, you lose that ability when. Um, you know, when you're suddenly told you have to move back to Australia in, in, in you know, 30 days because you, you're no longer legally allowed to live here. So that was a big one. And we've had, especially a lot of the airlines, they have prop, what they call provident funds, which with the way that they're structured, you know, you don't want to necessarily arrive back in the country the same taxi that you, you know, redeem these funds. Uh, we tend to straddle two financial years for that reason. Um, so, yeah, look, it's been a real... I open and it really has opened up uh, a lot of the pain points in terms of general things that we can avoid. But sometimes when the chronology is taken out of your control, um, then you're in mitigating the circumstances as opposed to um, you know trying to avoid them totally. Mm. Mm. Great. 
So let, let me ask you then a, or two pointed questions. So typically I would ask you, so what's the number one advice you give a, a future expat when it comes to uh, personal financial planning? Uh, but I will piggyback a second question on it. What would be your number one advice for um, a prospective repatriate who is now potentially in limbo and waiting for their next move or their return as it becomes um, possible for them during this uh, health pandemic. So what will be your number one advice on either side and when it, as it comes to financial planning? To me, before you go, every country is different. I think a lot of people just assume that it's the same tax rules. And it's, it's, a, it's a crazy thing to say, but they just assume that just things carry on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you go to say, uh, Dubai versus Denmark, you'll have completely different outcomes. So always research, you know, the country you're moving to. Um, Google's an amazing thing. There's, there is just untold assets and libraries on there of just complicated things. And people have written numerous blogs and articles and, and everything. And you can data mine these things. You know, how my parents moved to Tucson, Arizona in 1976 is beyond me. You know, they're just off they went. Um, these days, people Google, you know, TripAdvisor for looking at reviews of, you know, restaurants. So while you're doing that, just spend the extra 10, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, and just seeing what that other side of that landscape looks like. Because we mm -hmm. talk about it is two-dimensional financial advice, where you're coming from and where you're going to. Coming back, uh, either repatriating back to your home country or moving to another country, same process again. A lot of expats have been overseas for, for many years. And guess what? The IRS and the ATO and all the other HMRC they haven't stayed the same since you left. So quite often there are moving changes there as well too. So you need to do the same in reverse. And we always talk about, you know, change that constant that you can't predict. And, you know, even the best laid plans get thrown out, you know, from time to time. We had uh, clients in San Francisco who we spent 12 months preparing a repatriation. They've been in the US for, for 18 years. And at the 11th hour, uh, they pulled the pin and decided to stay in San Francisco. This was about two years ago. And I said, why? And I said, well, our, our daughters were born in San Francisco. They want to stay in the United States and we want to see grandkids. So guess what? We're just going to throw all that planning out the door because we want to spend time with our grandkids. So there's, it's not always about the money, you know, the emotional mm. side. And, and we always talk to clients about it has to feel good. You know, you don't want to be lying in bed at 10.30 on a Tuesday night going, oh, why did I do that for? Mm. Um these things have to be for a, a positive reason. They give you a lot of affirmation. Nice. Yeah, you may, we mentioned um, you mentioned you know culture shock or culture impact uh, before, uh, where I think those numbers are telling. Right? Is it? We, well, I would often say to a client that the impact of having a spouse or themselves be emotionally brought down. And the potential for that to cause the failure of the expat assignment is huge. Um, yeah. It is almost kind of you know, some people. I, I describe it when I went through it as a grief process. You know, it's a you, you're you're absolutely discombobulated. And then so in the clear light yeah. of day, it's hard. Just like you would lose another another person in your life. You know, through death or or other separation. You know, we have financial considerations in those, and often grief counsels will say. You know, let these issues lie. Do the minimum you can to keep the to keep the assets safe and and secure, but don't make any huge decisions when you're under the stress of culture. You know, of, of the stress of culture impact and and right. the transition. So that um, that's interesting. That 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 percentage you mentioned is uh, no doubt probably all also related. You know, emotion stress over money can court, you know can compound emotional stress and and vice versa. And, yeah, money's uh, the biggest cause of divorce. You know, and I think yeah. what we all often find is when you backtrack through a problem that an expert is experiencing, it was always there, but an overseas assignment combined with the stress of that assignment can just drive a wedge in that crack and just suddenly that whole thing becomes a massive thing. You know, people themselves say, I just can't, I'm not myself. I'm not myself. You know, oh. I know as an Australian expat right now, it feels weird that we cannot return back to Australia and all you know, friends, family, clients, you know, feel the same way, you know, out of coming out of Dubai at the moment. If I wanted to get back to Australia, the earliest I could get back is around February, March of next year. And it would have cost me 10,000 Australian dollars for a one-way ticket per person. 
Yeah. So in actual fact, it's cheaper probably to jump on one of those container ships. You know, you can rent the bedrooms. You know, at least they're back in Australia in 30 days. I could probably jump on one of those. So what we're finding is because people are feeling angst about not being able to visit family for Christmas, it's actually propagating out into other areas and finances is one of those too. So, mm. you know, we're now counselling as much as we're advising. Mm. Same as our work kind of. Right? Yeah. As you did the discussion with Brent last night about how much we cross that line from sometimes marriage counsellor to uh, you know, uh, a therapist and, and, and really people think we're turning up to talk about the culture, right, they're going to, which is important and that's a big part of it. But much yeah. of it is just from our experience and, and the things that we've gone through, just saying, you know, just understand this is an impactful time of your life. You know, you're changing the trajectory yeah. of your family, you're changing your family tree and at that same time you're also doing it financially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like it or not, finances are part of our lives. And as much as people like to put their heads in the sand and because, that, you know, it's not that they don't have time to deal with it, they just don't want to deal with it. And yeah. I've got to say, out of COVID, one of the positive things is a number of people have actually used this time to get on top of their finances. People yeah. have come to us saying, look, I've been having a great time for the last three years, but always said I should do something about it. But now I've been furloughed or laid off or, you know, people said I've, I've had three months to actually, you know, look at the dots on the wall and, you know, uh, that that free space or that free thought time to actually work on me as opposed to, mm-hmm. you know, working like a dog, you know, for my job, which most expats do. They, they work very, very hard. Mm-hmm. So there are positives that have come out of COVID, but there's also a lot of stresses and, and uh, that have come out as well too. Right. Well, I'm I'm glad there are people like you who help the overwhelmed expatriates tackle some of these issues when they are ready to be counselled or advised. Or as they say, the teacher will appear when the student is ready. Right. So, um, <laughs> um, and sometimes sometimes the student will be ready at a later time, and the teacher will remind them of the lessons they could have, should have learned maybe a year ago. But uh, I don't want to belittle this because Brett and I, we, we know this in our world that a lot of our clients come to us when it's hurting, when the pain yeah. has become insufferable. And um, it, it's easy to say, well, I told you so. You could have come to me a year before that and we could have mitigated a lot of that. But hindsight, we're always 2020. And um, in hindsight, this this year of 2020 will have taught us something as well. And and it's I think it's even if we start late, at least we get a start, right? We we need to look at how we manage our funds or how, how we manage our finances, no matter where in the world we are. I think this was very insightful, Brett. And and um, I think not enough people in the global mobility world are aware of the valuable services that companies like yours provide. No, thank you. I think it's something that, um, unfortunately, we get more publicity with people going through the pain. That makes sense. You know, right. we don't we don't want to grow our business on people having to come to us because they're suffering uh, financially, emotionally, whatever those reasons might be. But we often find that, um, you know, hopefully through, especially 2020, has highlighted a lot of pain points, which, you know, we've been aware of for many, many years, but it's really brought home those points. And, you know, we do see changes in global mobility policy. You know, I think when it comes to um, occupational health and safety and all those sort of considerations, you know, mm-hmm. finances needs to be one of those because I can I can tell you right now, people, you know, can, can cope with chopping a finger off or those sort of things. But when it comes to uh, being ordered by the IRS or the ATO, I think they'd rather chop a finger off. <laughs> yeah, they, they'll, they'll put you away for life and then you can sing behind bars, money, money, money. Oh, wait, actually, that <laughs> part right here. I see that? I'm holding on to it. Oh, uh, man. The no, money, 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 money episode. All right. This was lovely, I, folks. Where I think and also one, one point to leave it on as well, too, just, just on another thing is, you know, yeah. governments are now sitting on record debt. So, as a, oh. you know, it sounds cute when, when I say this compared to US examples, but, you know, the Australian federal government's going to have over a trillion dollars worth of debt um, in the year 2024-25. Now, the Australian economy is 1.7% of the world economy. US, their debt levels are even, you know, more extraordinarily higher and a lot of countries are in the same position. So, we are going to see tax reform. We are going to see the non-sexy side of 
stuff that expats are going to have to deal with and they are oh, going right. to have to pay attention to it because you know there are going to be some pretty pretty large unintended consequences or intended consequences um that may pursue oh yeah i, I think this is i think people are still too caught up with the the present uh, threat of the pandemic and a lot of governments are doing things to alleviate the financial burden that has evolved over this year and they're doing this not with money that they have stored away in the vault. They're, they're printing money and and yeah. they will, they're going to want it back. And that's it, it's going to pay the pipe at some point. It, we're we're, we're going to pay somehow down the mm -hmm. road. Just let's not get too comfortable around that. Yeah. No, exactly. And look, I think it's going to be something that, um, you know, US is, uh, you know, the US voting, uh, sorry, expats are a voting uh, part of the US elections. Unfortunately, Australia, we don't. So they can pass through legislation and we can't revolt by voting them out of office because we don't actually get the opportunity to vote anyway. So that's always another consideration as well for expats. You know, you mm -hmm. are the silent majority a lot of the time, even for expats who can vote, you know, yeah. these factor deals, um, you know, they're incredibly punitive, but, you know, people in Capitol Hill, they just do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. That that's a that's I think a, a a whole new series, Brett. We should start about yeah. <laughs> things that people in capital want to do. <laughs> that's a whole culture. I'll start, one, I'll start one for Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, be dueling shows. Yeah, well, that's great. So, where do we find you, Brett? What's the uh, what's the website for um, Atlas? Uh... Yeah, pretty easy. www.atlaswealth.com. all the w's uh, dot atlaswealth dot com. So we've got a pretty simple name. You know we're globally minded and it's the reason for the name but um uh yeah. we're on social media world on your shop like atlas right <laughs> yeah exactly that's right actually yeah so uh we're on the uh, on the representative socials you know facebook linkedin uh youtube got a pretty poor showing on instagram so if you want to look at a couple of photos of the office go for there but um you know where our broadcast channels are primarily linkedin and, and facebook and obviously our website um you know which you know it it's still boggles the mind when I look at Google Analytics, you know, where people are reading our articles and, and those sort of information from. But, you know, we, we try and be the conduit information because we know that the federal governments do a very poor job in communicating with experts. Mm. So when right. we see stuff, we, we do watch the IRS and the ATO on a daily basis. I don't recommend it. It's pretty boring. But if we do see something that does affect our clients, um, you know, we like to let people know within 24 to 48 hours because... I don't know how governments expect expats to learn about these changes, you know, osmosis, ESP. But um, from our point of view, you know, we need to have that sort of broadcast capability just to let them know. I mean, they can go, okay, it's great, and not act on it. That's fine. But, um, you know, to quote our friend, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, you know, there's the known known, and, you know, the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns, and half the stuff that expats have to deal with are the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. True that. I right. agree. Cool. Well, thanks for taking time. Um, you can put put your necktie back on and go all <laughs> right. well management now. And um, the casual part of your day is over now. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I'm not wearing board shorts, by the way, so I'm not right. uh, I'm actually wearing a full suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to the two Bretts and the, the two chaps are out for now. Join us back again tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Oh,